supposed to be developing our prayer life. The reason why we're supposed to learn the word of God is because we have an enemy who is in control of this world. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. That's what Satan said to Jesus. Now, what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only so shall you serve. By the way, that one little verse is in a nutshell of what Jesus has dealt with with Satan from all this time. Satan wanted to be worshipped. And then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down for him. And now Satan is quoting scripture to Jesus. For it shall be given him his angels charge over you and to keep you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed until a future opportune time. And Jesus returned in, the, in power of the Spirit to Galilee. And the news of him went out through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Break this down a little bit for you. <coughs> Satan attacks. Turn this, bread, this stone to bread. What's that mean? Hey, obey me. Satan's telling to God, obey me. Jesus defends with the sword of the Spirit. It is written, man does not live by bread alone. Enemy tempts. Enemy says, obey me. Jesus says, obey the word of God. Satan attacks. I will give you all authority and splendor for it to be given to me. And I can give it to anybody I want. So if you worship me, all will be yours. And I will give you anything that if you obey me, Again, obey me. Jesus defends with the sword of the Spirit and is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Satan attacks again. Now Satan is trying to use the sword of the Spirit against Jesus. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. And he goes and quotes it. He says, For it is commanded by the angels concerning to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in your hands so that you won't strike your foot against the stone. Here's the first suicidal thought in Scripture. Satan says, go ahead, commit suicide, Jesus, and see if I won't raise you up. Jesus defends with the sword of the Spirit, saying, you do not tempt the Lord your God and be put to, to be put to a test. We see here Jesus defended himself against three attacks from the enemy. The devil tried to use the word against Jesus, but anybody who reads the word and studies it will understand that by using the complete armor of God, we'll be able to withstand the attacks of the devil. Now, I've said this before, and I don't mean to make light or fun of the scripture, but any idiot who reads this word can come to a conclusion. If you were a chimpanzee, you could read the scripture, if you could read, and come to the conclusion why did Jesus have to go off and pray? Was he talking to himself? Jesus would do this great public miracle. Then he would have some confrontation with people who didn't want to hear what he's teaching. And then he had to go to explain it to his 12 disciples who weren't always the brightest bulbs on the planet. Who would be sometimes argumentative. Who had this, 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 this selfishness going on amongst them. Where Jesus is trying to point out really key points in their lives. And they're arguing about who's the greatest. Totally missing the fact that the guy that's talking to them right now just fed 5,000 people with a few tuna sandwiches. But they were in this constant turmoil. And after all that, what did Jesus regularly do? He stole away time to be with his father to restore himself. Now, if the Son of God needed prayer time, who are you to think you can get out get out with just pulling down your visor at Wawa on, on Monday morning and get your little day, our daily bread and read for five minutes? And say, okay, I'm, I'm ready to face today. You're an idiot. Why aren't you spending serious time in prayer? Jesus did. And if Jesus did, who are you? Hey, let's take this a step further. Jesus quoted scripture against the spiritual darkness of this present world. Wasn't it enough the fact that the Bible says he was the word of God? Shouldn't he just be able to walk into the room and the enemy go, ah, what happened here?
the enemy would make fun of him. The spirits, let me read this one. In Luke 4, 34, they said, Ha! So, do you want to be with us, Jesus of Nazareth? They were laughing and mocking Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, they called him Jesus of Nazareth instead of acknowledging him as Lord, Lord and God. Remember, these spirits were, were, were realized that people would make a joke about Nazareth saying, can anything good come from Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? They were tempting him, knowing that it was not yet the time. They taunted him. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. They were tempting him. Now, that they, that now is not the time that they taunted him. Fingers aren't working this morning. They defied him in his face, telling, telling him, we know who you are, and we are mocking you. What did Jesus say? Be quiet. Jesus said, looked him in their eyes and said, shut up. And he called them out. His mere presence wasn't enough. He had to speak the word of God. You and I, if we were to grow in grace, you and I, if we were to experience an abundant life, you and I, or if we are to live a dynamic life and be able to overcome obstacles and overcome all the temptation that is thrown at us, we have to have the ability to draw the sword of the Spirit and use the word of God against the enemy. When you face temptation, you need to use the word of God. When you're coming up against obstacles that you're seeing in your ministry and your personal life and your business life, you need to be using the word of God in your prayers. You can't take this for granted. Just showing up wasn't enough. The enemy went... And Dewey said, shut up, and then he called them out. If this is how Jesus operated, who are you and I to get by not using this? We have the most phenomenal weapon that God could ever give humanity itself. And we never use it. Go back to Hebrews 4.12. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, to the joints and marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your heart. This series has changed me. I am more broken than I've ever been in my life. I look at my frailties, I look at my weaknesses, I look at, at who I've become because of the sin that has, that has been in my life. For all these years. I'm not saying horrible. I'm saying the fact is the older you grow, the more you realize of where you came from. The older you grow, the more you realize of your weaknesses. The older you get, don't you just get fed up and frustrated and say, you know, I'm tired of being that person. I'm tired of living that way. I'm tired of that coming back and haunting me. And you know what it does? It drives you, if you're an honest person, into God's word and saying, God, you are my only hope. You know? You are my shield about me. Without you, I'm going to die. And it causes this desire, this burden, this passion within you to change because you, you don't want to let God down. You don't want to, you know? Listen, I'm an old school guy. There are times I'm just, I hate stupid people, you know? Don't you just want to reach out and give slap somebody every once in a while? Don't you just have that urge that you're saying, come on! Atheists, I mean, oh, drives me nuts. I'm throttle them. Look at creation. Stare into that. I, 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 I was with somebody one time, and they were going off about there is no God. And yet they were talking about this brand new baby that they had in their life. And how can you stare into the blue-eyed little beautiful child and deny that there's no God? How can you do that? It's like, excuse me, isn't the obvious right here in front of you? That there's living proof that God is real. 
How can you not look at creation and the magnificence of creation and say that this all happened by chance? I'm sorry, but that just drives me nuts. Like, it's just, really? I'm an artist. I look at, look at how magnificent this is. And God's word says, he's numbered the hairs on your head. Now, that means he's got an angel keeping track after me because mine's turning white and falling out, which means he's got a running score going here, you know? It's a joke. You and I need our daily bread. You and I need to be hungry for the Word of God. Not just to feed ourselves and to spiritually grow, but I think this whole passage confirms in your spirit this morning as it's done in mind and studying it that our, mere, our complete survival of our calling, of who we are, what we will ever be doing, is intertwined with how we use the Word of God. That if you neglect to learn about the Word of God, if you neglect to get into the Word of God and to grow, if you neglect to ever use it, you've been defeated before you ever get up out of the chair. I think Billy Graham's a pretty amazing guy. My buddy Steve Chante was down in Carolina one time at his conference center, at Billy Graham's conference center, and uh, heard Billy actually say the words that 90% of all Christians will never share their faith at one time in their life. I think that's a very sad, sad, sad statement. But it's true. We sit back and we never share who God is in our lives. But you know, there's a, greatest, or there's a greater issue now brewing. Do you know Bible sales are off the chart? We have more English translations than we have ever had in, our, in, in, in the world. There are more translations now than there have ever been. Bible sales, a half a billion Bibles a year. A half a billion Bibles, and yet, Bible illiteracy is growing at a horrific rate. People don't know the Word of God anymore. Most of you never went to Sunday school. Most. If you're under 30, you probably haven't. You think Job is Job. And yet we have more translations in our language than we have ever had. It's, it's still the number one seller. On Amazon. It's an amazing thing. And yet, we don't treasure it. We're not reading it. We're not hiding it in our hearts. Lord knows we're not using it the way God intended. It's a weapon, a warfare against the enemy who wants to crush you. Two things I want you to realize. If you are not dealing with spiritual warfare in your life, there's a really good chance the enemy doesn't take you as a threat. Because you've never opened this book. Some of you are dealing with tremendous pressure right now in your life. And I'll guarantee you that almost everybody that I know that's dealing with stuff is dealing with stuff because they are in this work, they're growing in this work, and they want to do serious ministry. And the enemy says they're a threat and I'm going to attack. And I'm going to tempt them. I'm going to beat them down so they will quit. Your only hope is to learn this and use it. It doesn't mean you need another Bible study. It means you need to feed yourself and start practicing using this yourself. It's not your spiritual leaders that are going to be saving you. It's your relationship with Jesus Christ. So this morning, I'll leave you with this thought. If you aren't using your Bible, if you're not in your Bible, if you're not growing in your Bible, are you really a Christian? Has God transformed your heart? If you are, realize that you're not alone, that we're in this together. 
comes back to this whole book of Ephesians that it's about us as a unity, it's about us as community, that we need to be, this group, these, these people in, this, in the New Testament met daily. They hung out together. Why? Because they realized that they needed each other. They needed to encourage each other in the Lord. You need each other. You need to be encouraged in each other to use this. It's been a good series. I hope, I pray it has fortified you. I pray that it has built you up. I pray that it has encouraged you. And I pray that you would take more seriously your personal walk. If I've offended you today, good. Because there's coming a time when we will be on the other side. And I know how God works. He's going to call churches together and poor guys like us. You have what, your, your 2000 through about 2008. I, I don't have to worry about being answerable for those years. You were on that watch. It's now my watch. You know what I'm saying? 2007 or so to now. Jesus will say, hey, I'm dealing with so-and-so over here. Did you tell them what I told you to tell them? I told you. We will have this conversation on the other side if you, just, if you choose to ignore it out. I love you. I care about you. This is a powerful thing. It can change your life. It can revolutionize what you're going through. You can see victory. Let's pray. Father, you're amazing, God. Thank you for a real relationship that we're not just praying to a statue. We're not just holding in beads in our hands, hoping so, and hoping if you're hearing us. Lord, that we know that you live and you rule and you reign in our hearts. That you've totally set us free. But Lord, that we are set at liberty. Lord, that we know based upon your word that you care about us. That you think of us often. That you desire good things and good gifts to be bestowed upon us. That you desire, Lord, to use us. Father, we thank you this morning that we can come and we can know for sure that you love us. We know for sure that you have a plan and purpose for our lives. I, I pray this morning for those here who are, are struggling with this walk with you. That, Lord, that today that they would surrender once for all to the meaning of your calling. I pray for those who are struggling with temptation, that, Lord, that they would realize that this message today will give them the ammunition that they need to overcome temptation. That, Lord, that as we all struggle, and we all do struggle, that you're there and present. But, Lord, we have to use the answers that you've given us, not hoping for an easier way, not hoping for a different way. I pray that you just confirm that in our hearts this day as we grow in grace. Lord, it could be one person today who's struggling, one person today who is just unsure of the relationship with you, that they would, they would seek, seek us out this morning for us to pray for them, for us to encourage them. I pray for my friends this morning who are struggling with temptation that you, Lord, would provide the means of escape. Would you accept it? Lord, thank you for this series. Thank you for speaking to our hearts, to illuminating our hearts and our minds to your truth. I pray to now, Father, as we close in worship, that you help us to reflect on these things this morning, to meditate upon what you've spoken to our hearts, that your kingdom would come, your will would be done in each and every person's life for this day. That we would be able to leave this place encouraged and built up and fortified. We thank you for this day on your Sunday. Enjoy the last one.